Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And see the long-term impacts of climate change. But we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Looking at the uh, world of food, plants and animals, all this is very important for humankind. We all understand that. And there's millions of different actors that are involved in actually bringing us the food not just the corporations and the big box department stores and groceries, uh, but really the plants and animals that surround us on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to be learning about that as far as what is a pollinator. This is Carrie L. Wexted. She's the Education and Outreach Specialist, Wildlife and Heritage Services at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And Carrie, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. Uh, tell us why wildlife and heritage in the same service for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So the Wildlife and Heritage Service is made up of multiple different programs. We have our traditional wildlife programs that include the ducks and the bucks. And we have our natural heritage program, which also works with our what we call non-game species, or those that are rare, threatened, and endangered and, and not hunted. So, um, so the wildlife and heritage essentially is a combination of both those um, organizations essentially. And it, we all work together to ensure the long-term conservation of our native ecosystems, natural communities, and the species that are supported by them. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, what is a pollinator? Let's just start yeah. off with that. So a pollinator is essentially an organism that moves pollen from one plant to another, um, or sometimes just even within a single plant. So a good example here is this bee, and it's on a passion flower, and all that yellow stuff right there is pollen that it's going to be moving along. Yeah, and looking at the color of the flower, why is it so colorful and it actually has these uh, very wispy forms? as well. Is this attractive to the bee? It is. And actually what bees see is very different than what we see. So bees see in the ultraviolet spectrum. And a lot of those designs look like neon flashing lights to those bees. Yeah, I tell you, this is really a beautiful plant. Now looking at this, we have this uh, mix. You got the hummingbird, but also we have the bat in this. And we kind of think of bats not really as pollinators and uh, we're kind of wondering uh, why that exists in nature, but these all coexist and are very important in very different ways because they have evolved together. Yeah, um, the diversity of pollinators is very diverse, just like the diversity of flowers and plants that are out there. So night blooming plants that are white and have strong fruity scents are usually attractive to bat pollinators. And bats are really important in tropical areas, not only for pollination, but also for seed dispersal to allow for that reproduction and traveling of those plants. Then we have things like birds, such as our hummingbirds, that um, are our only vertebrate pollinators or ones with backbones here in Maryland. Now, looking at the diversity, we're really seeing a diverse <laughs> sense as far as these uh, pollinators are concerned. So tell us how this mix is really important to us humans and to fathering actually the animal and the plant kingdom. Yeah, so these are just a sampling of some of the pollinators that people don't think of as pollinators. So there are very few mammal pollinators, but the black and white ruffed uh, lemur actually assists with pollination of traveler's palms. 
Um, so they, uh, they stick their faces down in those flowers and pick up all that pollen. And there are even some lizards and geckos that also help with pollination by essentially moving that pollen around. And the slugs can help too. So the picture on the far right is wild ginger, which can be found here in Maryland. It um, flowers on the ground. So little things like slugs and ants help it. Yeah, it's just amazing the diversity. Looking at butterflies though, this is something that uh, we really think about as far as pollinators and the butterflies and how do they really aid and assist nature as far as pollination is concerned? Well, a lot of pollinators are really good at drinking nectar. Um, so they have those really long tongues, but they don't always have the parts to successfully move the pollen around. So some butterflies are better than others. Some of them have sticky brush feet that help pick up pollen. And some of them are a little hairier on the bottom that helps pick up pollen as well. But these are kind of the poster children of pollinators, particularly because they're so pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, do the colors actually aid in pollination? Or is this just how they've evolved over time uh, in concert with the plants? That's a good question. And I think a lot of the colors of these pollinators, at least for the, um, for the butterflies, have evolved more for sexual selection within the species than, um, than for pollination. So in other words, we really are aiding and abetting pollination. We just have to have them out there. So uh, yeah. either one way or the other. Uh, looking at uh, beetles and ants and all these other types of things, how do they help pollination? <laughs> Well, beetles were the first pollinators on the scene, and around the world, they're the most numerous invertebrate pollinators that we have. So, um, so that's a locust borer beetle that you'll often find in late summer in Maryland. And ants help with pollination, so, um, but a lot of what ants do is more seed dispersal related. So um, much like butterflies, they're not as good at picking up that pollen and moving it around, but they do visit some flowers. And then we have moths that also help with pollination. And on the right-hand side, that's a daytime flying moth known as a hummingbird moth. Yeah, these are just really beautiful though in the diversity. Uh, just tell us more. I'm gonna go through some of these uh, images that you've shared with us and uh, I'll just chime in when I need to. Go ahead. <laughs> well, these are really the big wigs of pollination in our area here wasp, bees, and flies. Um, they're the three that, that typically pick up the most pollen and are able to move it around. So a lot of people don't think wasp as pollinators, but um, wasp were the second on the scene after beetles. And some species like the yellow jacket pictured there actually eat nectar and pollen as adults. So they're really important for pollination in their adult stage while they eat uh, insects for their juvenile stage. Then, of course, we have flies that do the same thing. And then our bees, they're so hairy. They're our best pollinators that we have around. Now, tell us what we're actually seeing here, uh, the physical makeup of this bee. Uh, you're highlighting it. Uh, it really is stylized. Uh, but actually, it's, it lo almost looks like a buffalo. <laughs> well, when most people think of bees, they think of this bee in particular. And this is the European honeybee. It's a species that's widely trafficked for um, pollination of agricultural crops. And um, they're extremely hairy, so you can see all of that. And uh, they also are gentlists. So that means that they really don't care what flowers they eat from, they'll eat from whatever you provide them. And they make honey too. So, But in North America, the honeybees are kind of like the chickens of the bee world because they are an agricultural species. They're not one that's natural to our ecosystems. Now you uh, had a question as far as uh, what are native uh, honeybees uh, to North America. Do we have such a critter? We don't have native honeybees, but we have a diversity of a lot of other bees that are found here in North America. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something we're looking at here. Tell us a little bit about this diversity and, uh, and do these specialize as far as the pollination is concerned? So this graphic is from Sam Drogi, who works with the USGS Bee Lab. And uh, it's just a small sampling of the over 4,000 bee species that can be found in North America. Did you say 4,000? 4,000, 4, yes. That's incredible. It's incredible and, and you can see the diversity in shapes and sizes and colors and they have diversity in their techniques for pollination too. Like our bumblebees, they buzz and um, shake the pollen out. So it's called buzz pollination. 
And uh, mm -hmm. of course, there's some species that don't pollinate at all. They just steal from others, but that's a topic for another day. Okay. Well, this is really interesting. Uh, social versus solitary. Tell us what we're looking at here. Uh, we can certainly understand the social part, but the solitary, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Well, in Maryland, we have over 430 bees, and um, most of the species that we have are so have solitary nesting habits. And essentially, after mating, the females are responsible for finding or building a nest, provisioning it with food, laying her eggs, and sealing it up all by herself. <laughs> so that's a lot of work for a single mom, and they often have short lifespans. Um, in contrast with our social bees, that include those European honeybees and some of our bumblebees, they have division of labor. They have a colony and somebody's job is to find the food while somebody else cares for the young and somebody else defends the nest. Now looking at uh, bringing the bees into uh, North America, you keep referring to these as the European uh, bees. Now why uh, long ago did they decide they really needed to be bringing these into uh, North America? In essence, now they become almost as a, a native species. They were brought here for, um, for pollination and also for honey production because none of our native bees produce honey, at least in a, a quantity that could be harvested like those European honeybees. And this is what we're talking about here. Uh, share with us as far as the honey, why it's so important and what is this actually bringing to uh, the plant kingdom by having honey? <laughs> well, honey is mainly for us. Um, but the evolution of solitary versus social bees is really fascinating to me. Um, sociality occurred later in evolution, and the social bees and social wasp um, tend to be more defensive around their colonies, and that's because they've had to fend off larger predators like mammals, like us, mm -hmm. particularly the honeybees, if you think about them. Um, they had to evolve a venom that was reactive to humans and larger animals like bears that would get into their colonies. So if you think about snacking on a single flower tube with a couple of bee babies in it for a solitary bee, it doesn't provide a lot of nutrition to us. However, a honeybee colony has protein-rich babies dipped in honey, and so they had to evolve a venom that was essentially going to deter us from eating them. <laughs> I see. So that's really important and for their survival. Okay, tell us the difference in what we're seeing here, Carrie. So here are two examples of our solitary bees that are found in Maryland. And these are both ground nesting bees. So they spend most, most of their lives in the ground and they're specialists, meaning that they only visit a, a select number of plants. The one on the left is the spring beauty bee. It's a tiny uh, woodland uh, bee and it has the best schedule ever. It essentially is active from about 10 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon <laughs> when the temperatures are the warmest and they take rainy days off because it's not energetically, it doesn't make sense to, to uh, go out and forage when it's cold or wet out. So I'm down with that. <laughs> um, so the bee on the right is the squash bee and that's a gardener's friend. They live in the ground, usually close to our vegetable gardens. And as their name suggests, they pollinate squashes like zucchinis and pumpkins. And um, they have a very special relationship with that. Sometimes you can gently open up those flowers in the morning and you'll see the males snoozing inside. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, we're out of time. Uh, if you can give me about uh, 10 seconds, what do you see for the future as far as wildlife and heritage services? Got to be quick. <laughs> the future of wildlife and heritage service, well, right now we're just working on sustaining our, our wildlife populations and um, just keeping up with current science and technology. That's fantastic. This is Carrie L. Wexted, Education Outreach Specialist in the Maryland Department of Natural Resources as we create the Emerald Climate.